Harold and Maud tells the story of Harold and Maud. Oh, we never get tired of doing that. That's very interesting. Harold, played by Bud Court, is a young man who, for some reason, is obsessed with the concept of death. Maybe he's related to Tim Burton, I don't know. He hangs around funerals and he even fakes several suicide attempts to psychologically traumatise his beloved family. It's a happy movie! I'd say so. His mother, obviously worried about him, tries to set him up with several young ladies, but he's far too interested in an old 79-year-old woman named Maud, played by Ruth Gordon, who he meets at one of the funerals. Her carefree, rebellious nature gains Harold's attention, and they form a strong friendship. Bit creepy. Oh, that would have to be yes, wouldn't it? <laughs> Colin Higgins wrote the story as his master's thesis whilst in the UCLA. He originally thought it up as a play, which then became a 20-minute thesis. Later on, he'd become poor boy to producer Edward Lewis, and Higgins showed the script to Lewis's wife. She was so impressed, she asked her husband to show it to Paramount Pictures. Originally, Higgins sold his screenplay, intending to direct it himself. However, after some tests, it was determined that the studio wasn't happy with it, and they didn't think that he was quite ready to direct a movie just yet. How Ashby came along to take on the job, but only after he got Colin Higgins' blessing. But Higgins even hung around on set to watch and learn from him, even becoming a co-producer. Originally, they wanted Maud to be a European, considering Peggy Ashcroft, Edith Evans, Gladys Cooper, Celia Johnson, Lottie Lenya, Louise Rayner, Paula Negri, Minta Durfee, Agatha Christie, Edwige Fillier, Elizabeth Bergner, Mildred Natwick, Mildred Dunnock, and Dorothy Stickney. For the part of Harold, Richard Dreyfus, Bob Balaban, and John Savage were all considered, but were relatively unknown at the time. John Rubinstein and Elton John were also in hopes to do the music, but they backed out, and Cat Stevens would end up doing the job instead. I suppose you think that's very funny. Originally, Harold and Maud received mixed reviews, many finding it too dark and not very funny, mocking several sensitive subjects. And so what we get, finally, is a movie of attitudes. Harold is death, Maud is life, and they manage to make the two seem so similar that life's hardly worth the extra bother. The visual style makes everyone look fresh from the wax museum, and all the movie lacks is a lot of day-old gardenias and lilies and roses in the lobby, filling the place with a cloying sweet smell. Nothing more to report today. Harold doesn't even make Paul Bearer. <coughs> Bizarre complaint. Yes, this movie was fantastic. The cinematography was shot very well. Lighting was magnificent. All acting performances were extraordinary. But I was really annoyed that Rich wasn't the shopkeeper. I mean, me run a shop on a Sunday of all things. Absolutely not. 50 quid. You're on. <laughs> Fine, thank you. The actors are so aggressive, so creepy and off-putting that Harold and Maud are obviously made for each other. A point the movie itself refuses to recognise with a twist ending that betrays, I think, its life-affirming pretensions. The film was a runaway cult favourite, and most memorably, in Minneapolis, residents actually picketed the Westgate Theatre and tried to get the management to replace the picture after a consecutive three-year run. No. Over the years, it began to build a cult following. The Writers Guild of America even picked it as the 86th greatest screenplay ever written. The American Film Institute ranked it as the 45th funniest American movie in history, with the gross love story as the 69th most romantic. Empire picked it as the 65th greatest film ever, or Entertainment Weekly called it the fourth best cult film in history. And Bud Court and Ruth Gordon both received a Golden Globe nomination, but neither were victorious. Come back, come back. You know love. But man, the opening sequence is so happy. This is so uplifting and wholesome. It really puts you in a good mood. How can people call this film dark? Dude, Jesus Christ! What a way to start the movie! I suppose you think that's very funny, Harold. Hello? Hello? Faye? Yes? Darling, be a dear and cancel my appointment with Rene this afternoon. Okay, I hate myself for laughing at that, but straight away, this movie has my sense of humour written all over it. Then he fakes slitting his own wrists. Jesus Christ, what the f*** is wrong with this kid? It's another Eric Harris in the making. What do you do for fun? What activity gives you a different sense of enjoyment from the others? What do you find fulfilling? What gives you that special satisfaction? Psychologically destroying the people that I love and mentally scarring them for the rest of their lives? I go to funerals. Okay, his answer was funnier. 
hoping someone would miss me Thinking about my home But this soundtrack is amazing! It's so upbeat! You can't help but smile and feel in a good mood when listening to it. Yeah, before he fakes his suicide again. I'm so confused and conflicted! It is time you settled down and stopped flitting away your talents on these little amateur theatrics. Why are you all acting like this is completely normal? He fakes suicide on a daily basis. Someone get this kid a shrink. Look at this. It's so f***ed up. But really funny. I won't lie. I mean, I bet you're laughing too, you sickos. This movie has balls. How many of these suicides have you performed? An accurate number would be difficult to gauge. Well, just give me a rough estimate. A rough estimate? Mm. Let's say... 15. 15?! And you haven't got him help yet?! You have led a very carefree, idle, happy life up to the present. The life of a child. But it is time now to put away childish things. He's faking suicide! It's not like he's still playing with Lego! In short, Harold. I think it is time for you to get married. So he can mentally destroy another woman as well? Your judgment to go against him whom the loyal prayer of Christian faith commended your mercy. Rather, by the help of your grace, may he escape the sentence. Uh, call the police? Who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Like some licorice. Okay, okay, pause, right? If this was the other way around, if this was a 70-year-old man hanging around a young woman, the police would be right on that. And I don't care how sweet it gets later on in the movie. The way this is set up straight away, nah, nah, man, this is so creepy. And they never specify Harold's age. I think he's supposed to be early 20s, but look at him. He has the face of a 10-year-old. This is just wrong. We shall have to meet again. Uh, Tony, you don't. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that woman, she took my car. Okay, that makes up for it. You really don't see that coming. Now then, are you ready, Harold? Here is the first question. Are you uncomfortable meeting new people? Oh, that's not a question. Hey, Deckard, ask him a real question. You're watching television. Suddenly you realize there's a wasp crawling on your arm. Much better. Should women run for president of the United States? I don't see why not. Still waiting. Is it difficult for you to accept criticism? Oh, hey, it's Lord of the Rings fans. He even points a loaded gun towards his own mother and she doesn't even react. Can someone lock this loony up? Do you enjoy... Harold, please. Do you have ups and downs without obvious reason? <laughs> this movie is amazing. Lord, my body. <laughs> it's so casual. Oh look, she's at another funeral cruising for some prepubescent dick. These are two weirdos going to random funerals. It's so disturbing. Doesn't anybody ever question them being there when they don't know anyone there? Who was that old lady who was waving to you earlier? Hello, Harold. Can I give you a lift? She is grooming this poor boy. I don't care if you give him the oldest man's name you can think of. He's still a child. You hop in any car you want and just drive off. Well, not any car, I like to keep a variety. I'm always looking for the new experience. <laughs> Maybe. Nevertheless, I think you're upsetting people. I don't know if that's right. They're coming from you! Please sit down, Harold. I'll put the kettle on. We have a nice hot cup of tea. And then you can protect me as the cops burst in. But this is the first date set up for Harold by his mother. But look, he looks six and she looks 26. Stop with the paedophiles. Must have been very funny. <laughs> 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 Harold! Finally, a normal reaction. Dan has just been telling us such a funny little story about... 
Walter Cronkite. A villain leaving an opening for a sequel cut! So he returns to see Maud, but she's naked. Ew, stop it, you pedo! Do you disapprove? Me? No, of course not. Ew! Really? Do you think it's wrong? You are going to jail! There is a subtle moment where Harold considers faking a suicide in front of Maud, but doesn't actually go through with it. To me, this is the defining moment of their relationship. Maud is the only one there for him who doesn't judge him, so he can't bear to put her through that pain. Uh, tell me about yourself. What do you do when your aunt visiting funerals? Going to school, you little pedo! I like to watch things grow. Like underage boners. Look, see... Some are smaller, some are fatter, some grow to the left, some to the right, some even have lost some petals, all kinds of observable differences. You see, Harold, I feel that much of the world's sorrow comes from people who are this, yet allow themselves to be treated as that. Why does it sound like Maud is about to break into song right here? It is 
hilarious how she just casually steals any car she finds or then crashes and illegally parks them and then just steals another one. She's amazing. Then she skips a stop sign and the cops don't even do anything. Eh, accurate, she's white. When I was a little girl, I was taken to the palace in Vienna to a garden party. I can still see the sun shining, the parasols, the flashing uniforms of the young officers. I thought then that I would marry a soldier. But then I thought, f*** it, I'll blow a preschooler instead. But I do have to commend Bud Court as Harold. He nails this performance as the socially awkward and mentally lost child. He is perfect. And Maud plays the piano and sings to him, which is immediately really cute and sweet. Oh, that was fun. Let's play something together. I don't play anything. Nothing. Dear me. Everybody should be able to make some music. <laughs> You'd think, but then there's rice gum. She'll never let me breathe. Post it up on the phone, like what you mean? We got me, he pull up, he got the lead. If she wanna put dick inside her spleen. <sighs> Why is the cop walking like he just pissed himself? License, lady? I don't have one, I don't believe in them. Fair point. How long have you been driving, lady? Up to 45 minutes, wouldn't you say, Harold? Oh, I love her! Not in that way, you little nasty! Yeah, let me get this straight, lady. All right, then, we'll be off. Nice chatting. <laughs> she is a legend! A paedophile, but a legend nonetheless! She even circles the cop to escape him. She's a criminal! I just love how Harold doesn't even react to any of her criminal activities. They're as bad as each other! She even steals a cop's bike! But this is the best scene, and it is beautifully done. Considering how dark and then ridiculous the rest of the movie is, you don't expect such a deep moment. But Harold explains why he fakes his suicide so many times. The first time was when I was at boarding school, in the chemistry lab. I was in there cleaning it up. So, uh, I decided I'd do a little experiment, you know. So I throw this stuff out and began mixing it up. It was very scientific. <laughs> uh, there was this massive explosion. It knocked me down, blew out a huge hole in the floor. There was, uh, boards and bricks and flames leaping up. I figured, you know, time to leave. My career in school was over. So, uh, I went home. My mother was giving a party, so I just went right up the back stairs into my room. Turned out the light, and, uh, I got this funny feeling. The doorbell rang. I went out to the banister, and, uh, these two policemen came in. Found my mother. told her that I was killed in the fire. She put one hand up to her forehead, the other she reached out as if groping for support, and with this long sigh, she collapsed in their arms. that I enjoyed being dead. This scene perfectly describes depression, anxiety, self-esteem issues, attention seeking. It's so accurately portrayed, it is brilliant, and it makes you sympathize and relate with the character so much more. No, 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 you stop it. You stop it right now. Edith, I'd like you to meet my son, Harold. Harold, this is Edith. Why does everybody in this movie have an old person's name? Very pleased to make your acquaintance. I think you should go and wash up, dear, and join us in the drawing room. The what room? <laughs> the drawing room. I don't think I've been in there. <laughs> what do you mean we've got a room just for drawing in? Although we do do a large business. 
Barley was very big last week. Fifteen hundred... Okay, it's dark, but it's so funny at the same time! I find you have left me with no recourse but to listen to the solution proposed by your uncle. Consequently, I have instructed him forthwith to induct you into the service. And also, why am I wearing this ridiculous f***ing hat? How about hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat? Yes? To strangle someone, choke him, what? squeeze out his life in your own bare hands! I, I think you're getting carried away, uh, Harold. How about to uh, slit his throat? Well, I don't know I'd about like that. that. You can see the blood squirt out. But well, how about souvenirs? Souvenirs? Of your kill. Uh, yeah. I think you need to call up the asylum, mate. You've got the next Jeffrey Dahmer on your hands! Can you imagine you're just on holiday with your family and then suddenly you look over and see... Maud? Do you pray? She doesn't believe in driving licenses, mate. I doubt she believes in God. This is real nice. Yeah. Makes me want to do somersaults. Well, why don't you? <laughs> I feel stupid. Harold, everyone has the right to make an ass out of themselves. You can't let the world judge you too much. Okay, that dialogue is actually really well written. And it's nice to see Harold become more and more happy and filled with life. They somehow do make an old lady and a young man cute together. They do the impossible. How do they do that? Oh, Harold. <laughs> you make me feel like a schoolgirl. Ew, now it's creepy again. Sunshine, I'd like you to meet Harold. Harold, this is Sunshine Doré. That's not a name! And she looks 30 and you look 10! Was that planned? Oh, what a wonderful collection of knives. May no, no, I no, see no, no, them? No, don't touch. They're very old. Do you enjoy knives? God, he's so creepy! Somebody kill it! So he stabs himself in front of her. This one isn't even funny, it's f***ed up! No, go back to funny! Oh, that was marvellous. Never mind, they saved it. She even starts acting around him and he just looks annoyed as f*** as he looks over. Uh, before killing herself. But are you ready for the absolute best reaction ever to seeing your child possibly committing murder. Harold! That was your last date! <laughs> that reaction is amazing! I love this movie, and I don't even care. And then we cut to a fair, this is great. Harold loves more. This is the nicest present that I've received in years. Oh, hey, Luke Skywalker ripped this off. And yes, they even pork. All right. Isn't Harold's mum questioning all the times he's spending nights away? A very common neurosis, particularly in this society, whereby the male child subconsciously wishes to sleep with his mother. Of course, what puzzles me, Harold, is that you want to sleep with your grandmother. Well, he's got a point. Aw, they are so cute. It's such a happy and sweet ending. Nothing bad's gonna happen. <laughs> Couldn't imagine a lovelier farewell. What? Farewell? Yes, it's my 80th birthday. Well, you're not going anywhere. Are you? Man, he's so creepy! Is he threatening her? Yes, dear. I took the tablets an hour ago. I'll be gone by midnight. What? 
What a fuss this is. So unnecessary. Don't die, Maud, for Christ's sake. Oh, hell. Don't upset yourself so. You just killed yourself! I love you. I love you. Oh, hell. That's wonderful. Go and love some more. No! F*** you! This woman's a b Trouble, no oh, trouble, set me free. No, it's not I funny. Why is she doing this? Is I do love how she attempted suicide and is dying and they still take the time to ask her, hey, mind signing a few forms for us? But seriously, I try to find out why she did this as the movie never explains it. And the best I could find is she thinks that 80 is the right time to die, but that's it. It's also shown that she's a Holocaust survivor, but no other explanation for the suicide is given. Now, when this first happened, yes, I thought, wow, this is a selfish b But looking back, in a way, I kind of like it. And she's actually being selfless. I mean, let's be honest. Let's say this kid is 20. She has just turned 80 years old. The relationship clearly isn't going to work. She has taught Harold to love and to appreciate life and live life to the fullest. But she knows that the relationship isn't going to work. She knows that he needs to find someone closer to his own age. So as messed up as this is, her suicide is ultimately doing him a favor. She's sacrificing herself for his own happiness. I was actually hoping for a plot twist. Intercut with her dying is Harold driving intensely and I thought it was going to pan over to show her next to him still alive. But nope! She preaches for the entire movie about how you should live life to the fullest only to then kill herself. I mean, Harold even told his family that he was marrying her and then she does this. I do kind of wish they actually included more of a reason, but the fact that she was so overly happy is a great sign of depression. You don't know when someone's depressed, so it works to be ambiguous as well. But the thing is, Harold has constantly faked suicide for attention and he traumatized his family as a result. And now, as horrible as it sounds, he knows what it feels like. Throughout the film, he's so weird he drives a hearse. His mum replaces it with a Jaguar at one point and he then exchanges it for another hearse. After Maud dies, we get one more fake out as we believe he's driven off the cliff to die, but he hasn't. He wrecks the hearse and then plays the song that Maud sang for him. He's gone through this transition and is going on to live his life through her teachings. That side of him is ironically now dead. So on the surface, it looks like a miserable, depressing ending, but in a way, it's kind of inspiring and upbeat and happy. Upon analysis, I really like this ending. After the slow rise of the movie's success, the film was turned into a novel, and then Colin Higgins turned it into a play in Paris. He then expressed interest in a sequel and a prequel in 1978, and it would have shown Harold's life after the death of his love. But he also wanted to do a story of Maud's life before Harold. It was actually going to be a crossover of sorts. Maud was going to be shown learning how to steal cars from Grover, Richard Pryor's character from Silver Street. And they were both even going to reprise their roles, but this never materialized. The movie is masterful. They somehow make a love story between an old lady and a young boy romantic and sweet. They combine death and misery with side-splitting comedy, but it also hits you in the feels when it needs to. And the acting is incredible. I can't recommend this movie enough. <laughs> I watched this movie when I was actually really depressed. I was like, right, let's watch this comedy to cheer myself up. First scene, he hangs himself. I was like, great. Uh, thanks, movie.